Hello and welcome, I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet, and we're in a time of tumultuous bans all over the shop. I spoke yesterday in a video about how 2019 was super ban happy, almost comparable to 1999 which had the most bans in Magic's history. If you want to hear me talk a bit about Oko and the ramifications of bans, this video is available uh, in the description and in the links in the cards, and go watch it, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet, if you can't tell, I am a little bit sick, my throat is still fucked. I still have some sort of small cold bug, but here I am. Let's play some fucking magic, right? Now, Modern was shook up by these bannings. Oko needed to go, I completely agree. And people have been asking me what I felt about the other bans, so let's talk about them briefly now. Mox Opal had been living on borrowed time. There were just memes about it dodging the ban hammer or the bullet for the longest time. Wrecked. Whilst Mox Opal itself is more of an enabler than a payoff that upsets people, it tended to be in a lot of dumb broken decks, or decks that didn't feel healthy for the format. It was in things like Clark Clan, Ironworks, any of the X decks of the past. It was obviously a big part of the Affinity decks, and it ended up being very good when they printed things like Emery and Urza. I am actually quite sad to see it go, because it was an integral part of decks that I thought were very fun, and actually quite healthy. For every Lantern Control deck that people thought it was ruining the format, it was part of Traditional Affinity, for example, or Cheerio is another unique deck. I've played it in many decks on this channel, decks like Pure Steel, Pure Banter, which is a really old video now, but I'm sad to see it go. It's been an integral part of one for a long, long time, but I'm whilst I'm sad to see it go, I'm not surprised. Fast Mana is pretty much always broken. Um, Especially fast mana that does have summoning sickness. Dorks have an inherent uh, difficulty of having to have setup time. Well, Mock Opal is just powerful from the offset. Oko being banned, I talked about a lot yesterday and good fucking riddance to that. So please watch the video from yesterday to understand that. And then we come to Mike Sick Vladis, which is a card that has been a pet card of mine for a very long time. A bit of a story here about Mike Sick Vladis is that I am the bad person that used to play in EDH with March and Machines and the original Khan Silver Golem, where I'd for one mana I'd ping off people's lands. I've also played it alongside Vandal Blast. Um, I went to make modern videos with it many times prior to Khan the Great Creator being printed and never finished making the videos. I didn't think they were funny enough or interesting enough. It was originally going to be part of a, a mono red Tron deck where we Vandal Blasted all our opponent's permanents. I might have some gameplay of that lying on my hard drive somewhere. And originally this video that hit off my channel, Mono Red Tron, well that was going to have a cousin, a Doctor Tron, the more sophisticated DR Tron, which is going to be Door to Nothingness Red Tron. And it's going to use Mike's Flatters to basically activate Door to Nothingness. It was a video that I planned to make. This happens a lot. There's so much to do in Magic. So many formats, so many decks, so many cards to play with that I never got around to actually playing. So here we are in the new age, the new frontier of modern. And what do I think is going to be good? People are saying they think Tron has took a hit. I think Tron's still going to be just very, very good. I think Microsoft Lattice being gone obviously to power the deck slightly, but Tron will always be good. Cheating out Khans, Ugin's or Eldrazi will always be good. Next up we have Amulet. Amulet's the other deck that I think we need to not watch. I don't think it's a problem. I think the metagame will adjust. But I think prime timing off of Amulets and Bounce Lands and all that jazz is going to be really good for a little while. So, with the expected Let's All Ban Prime Time conversation coming to Twitter near you sometime soon, I want to make a video talking about Prime Time and that deck a little bit. I'm going to play the deck perhaps next week, once the Theros hype is down later this week, and get into doing some more modern and, and, and pioneer and legacy content. Oh shit, no. I'll be playing with a Theros cards. We've got Heliod to play with. We've got the Infinite Combo with the Aura to play with. We've got loads of stuff to play with. So I'll play some Amulet eventually. But anyway, today I'm going to show you a game where we played my favourite deck in the format that I think is now quite well positioned to try and Amulet the big decks, which is Green, White, Death and Taxes. This is the deck alongside Legacy, Death and Taxes that I've played on this channel the most because it is my favourite modern deck. I've enjoyed Flicker Wisping things for years and now the deck is just... It's just good against Amulet, it always has been. When Summer Bloom got banned, I was actually a little bit frustrated because when I played this deck, I got to kick the shit out of the Amulet Titan players. 
For those of you who don't know, the deck is designed to stop your opponent from doing their game plan while chipping away at them, and then it has a critical mass aspect in things like Shalai's activation or Gaffney Township to reward going wide to kill your opponent. Our primary taxing effects are Thalia and Leon and Arbiter, and the deck can actually grind quite well thanks to good ETB value. Four copies of Blade Spicer, for example, then we have Restoration Angel, Flicker Wisp, and Charming Prince to reset it, and then some other good ETBs too, Knight of Autumn, Eternal Witness, and so on. What I'm trying to say is you don't need to play fucking Blood Moon to beat Amulet. You just play four Ghost Quarters and the best cat ever printed in Magic. As always, this video is brought to you by ChannelFireball.com, the primary sponsor of this channel. They help to keep the lights on here. If you are signing up to a Magic Fest this year, make sure you use the code Kenobi when you sign up. And if you're buying anything from the Channel Fireball store, also use Kenobi in the discount code box. You should get a nice little discount too. And of course, the other backer of this channel is you. I have a Patreon where for just $2 a month, you can join in, get involved in the Discord server and the coming Minecraft server that I'm hoping we will launch next week. The higher tiers get to hang out with me on calls, help me brew and edit decks, have a pub quiz once or every every two months, and also submit decks that I do get around to playing sometimes. Sorry, Fuzzy! The largest contributors on my Patreon are on screen now, and with all that out of the way, let's play some magic. You know what they say, a one lander a day keeps the league trophies away. This hand has one painful land, an Aether Vile, and a Noble Hierarch in it, and a removal spell. This hand is potentially risky and slow simply because you do not have a 2-drop, meaning we might be stuck waiting for our Vile to tick up to deploy our 3-drop threats. Although, as you'll see shortly, Flicker Wisp is one of the best threats in this matchup. To clarify, I am going into this blind. This was just a league I've played. I've played uh, four leagues with this deck over the last like three days, and I've played against uh, Titan four times. I'm 4-0 against Titan across four leagues. Although Amulet Titan's best hands are probably too fast for us. We lead with Aether Vile, our opponent leads with Radiant Fountain, going up to 22 life. Oh look, they're winning! <laughs> Kill me. They then cast an Amulet of Vigor. Oh boy. Turn 1 Amulet is the engine that really makes this deck pop. But the question I have for you today, friend, is which one mana artifact is actually the better one, or more powerful? But not at all broken, don't you ever consider banning my fucking Vars, you slack-jawed cunts. Vote in the comment section below and let me know which you think is the best one mana artifact in modern. And a quick story time here. I opened one of these amulets at my World Wake pre-release in the same pool as a Jace the Mind Sculptor, which I later went on to sell for a whole 35 English pounds. I thought it was a truly garbage bulk rare that I... I put it into EDH decks and then it didn't do anything and I took it out. I just never really understood how you could abuse it until Summer Bloom started pushing my shit into modern back in 2015. It actually took me a while to realise that the cards in my deck interacted with their bounce lands in certain ways and eventually once that clicked, I actually started kicking the shit out of them. But don't worry, overall we all know who the victor in that battle was. Wrecked. We failed to draw a land. I know this video is titled something like how to beat Amulet Titan or some such nonsense, but I will give you some further advice. Missing your second land drop is not a winning strategy against such a powerful deck. Fill the dead from our opponent, which is good for us because it was not a green land. If it was a green land, we might have seen Sakura Snake Boob Monster or an Explore, depending on the variant of the deck. This means that they're off to a less than stellar start and a bit slower too. We're both spinning our wheels slightly. End of turn, we activate the Pokeball and we choose Noble Hierarch as our only option. We miss land drop again, and now we have two mana for a two drop and a Vile on two as well. And we have two two drops in our hand to develop our board with. But here's the interesting bit. I've actually decided here not to develop our board state with both the two drops. If they kept a hand that was this slow, it means one of two things. One, they've kept a hand that does nothing and we aren't going to be too punished for developing our board slowly. Or B, and this is the one where we have the highest chance of losing, is that they have a hand that's explosive once they hit their green source on turn three. What I mean is, I smell an Azusa in our future. I pass back, they play a gemstone mines, and lo and fucking behold, here she is, Azusa for three mana. Now, Azusa is a scary force in the amulet deck. What she allows you to do is, once there's an amulet in play, you can play a Karoo land. These lands tap for two mana and have the steep downside of entering tapped and bouncing your own land back to hand. 
but they come in and untap from a trigger on the amulet. This means with multiple land drops from Azusa, you can have it enter, tap it for mana, then bounce itself back to hand, replay it, untap it, tap it for mana, bounce it back to hand. And basically, with the two mana green producing uh, Karoo or bounce land, you can make six mana and tighten your opponent. Azusa, three land drops and a Simic Growth Chamber equals prime time when you have an amulet. The aim of the game needs amulet with our deck is to avoid them ever casting a prime time in the first place, or to stop them profiting off of the ETB effect. So here's the fun part. What you do is you mess with them whilst triggers are on the stack. When they put the untap and bounce triggers on the stack, I path the Azusa. This means they won't get the additional land drop this turn due to the fact that they can't play lands whilst triggers are on the stack. If you want to, conversely, on the amulet side of things, avoid this kind of blowout, you should lead with non-enter the battlefield trigger lands when developing your board with Azusa and not having a combo turn. How magic works is once your Azusa lands, your opponent doesn't get priority to path or bolt her until there is a trigger on the stack that passes priority. Playing a land does not pass priority unless when it enters the battlefield it puts a trigger on the stack, at which point priority is passed. As this goes bye-bye, and because of the Arbiter, they cannot search. They resolve their trigger, untapping the garrison and bouncing the mines back to hand. They have nothing else to do their turn and pass. We got a good tempo advantage there, and we took out one of the combo pieces. Now with Violin 3, the Flicker Wisp in hand, we get to really start messing with our opponent. We draw Thalia and attack for 3 with a Void Up Cat Jesus. Second main phase, I flicker out the Boris Garrison, then I cast a Charming Prince, still in main phase. Flicker out my Wisp to end the turn. The Garrison comes back and they bounce it back to hand, which is smart because when our Wisp came back, I was planning to flicker the Garrison again. Instead, I flicker out the Amulet for a whole turn, decreasing their chance of having an explosive turn where they go off. How Flicker Wisp works, for those of you that are new to the channel, is that the Amulet won't come back until the next end step. It's gone for an entire a turn. They play a mine, don't play anything else out of their six card hand and pass. We untap, do not take up VAR because three really is the sweet spot for modern version of this deck and go to combat. We slap them for seven damage. Then we cast a Thalia, then we end of turn use Vile and Wisp to take away their amulet for a turn again. They cast once upon a time in our end step, but I don't actually see what they grab. They untap and they scoop it up. There is a line here where we kept this Wisp in the Pokeball in case the hand had amulet, Azusa, Titan and some kind of green Karoo because taking their amulet out here would still allow them to get a Titan out if they had another amulet in hand. If we kept the Wisp for this circumstance we could wait for the ETB trigger and the untapped trigger from the amulet to go on the stack and then just flicker out the Karoo land until end of turn. That said we had a huge board state and Arbitrum played to prevent the ETB of Titan and if they had a second amulet on Azusa I feel like they would have cast it on the last turn as they didn't have the time available to sandbag things for an explosive turn out of nowhere. When boarding its amulet, I've come to the conclusion that I want to cut all my Thalias and both Giver of Runes, because they don't really do anything in the matchup, to bring in Knight of Autumn to hit their uh, amulets, double Dampling Sphere, a Dismember, and a Winds of Abandon. The Dismember isn't for the Titans, it's to kill Azus and secure scouts early so that we can stop them from tightening. And Winds of Abandon can hit any of their targets at sorcery speed, but the main thing is to give us an out against Field of the Dead making a bazillion zombies if we can't kill them in the air. Dampling Sphere is easily the best card in our sideboard against amulet decks. Not only does it make Karoos into lands that produce just one one mana instead of the normal two, but they still have the downsides, so they still come and play tapped, and they still bounce lands by the hand. It also makes them produce one colourless mana, importantly. This means certain hands will struggle through a damping sphere to actually create the double green they need for a titan, or be unable to commit to the traditional combo lines of activating Boris Karoos to activate Slayer's Stronghold and similar. Here's a fun fact. You're probably wondering why these bounce lands are colloquially called Karoos, right? Well, it's because they emulate or even call back to a land cycle from Visions in which the white one of all of them was called a Karoo. Now, I've known this for a while, but I didn't understand why the white one was the one referenced. I spent literally 30 seconds to a minute googling it, didn't find an answer, and I couldn't commit to any more time on this because I'm fucking busy. So if anyone knows, let me know in the comment section below why we call them Karoos colloquially in the community. That is a tongue twister, instead of like any of the other ones, like Abandoned Volcano or whatever. However, in my quick googling, I did find this comment from a 2013 thread on the MPG Salvation forums. The only modern deck the Karoo lands are good in is that Kangaroo deck with Summer Bloom and Amulet of Vigor. It is entirely possible of generating an Emrakul on turn 2, but it's highly inconsistent. I find this interesting for two reasons. First, I don't believe you can turn to an Emrakul within the realms of reality in which we call a home. I guess Summer Bloom might make it possible with the exact 7. And two, uh, <laughs> that the deck is being called inconsistent back then in 2013, when for the most part, very little new cards have been showing up since then to improve the deck. 
I mean, Field of Dead's made the deck stronger, I guess, but not necessarily more consistent. But to go back to that point about how it hasn't really got any new toys, I think it's really cool that this deck, alongside things like Death Shadow, have always kind of had the tools there. Like, Death Shadow didn't get anything really new up until, like, Tamo Battle Rage, and that's where Suicide Zoo really took off. What I like is the idea that these decks are out there somewhere, the tools are floating around, we just need the community to, to like, mine and understand it. We live in a world of instant and numerous feedback from the internet and still things go undiscovered. It makes me wonder what memes or fringe shit is still playable or could become a tier 1 deck in modern Pioneer or Legacy that we just haven't found yet. I think that's a really cool aspect of magic. In game 2 I draw an opening hand and I'm immediately confused. This is an Avian Rift Watcher, a card that I think is actually very good in certain metagames. I have dunked on burn players locally multiple times thanks to this laser powered bird rebel soldier. Thing is... It's a cyborg card that I didn't think I'd sleeved up in over a year. Turns out, in my haste to record this video earlier in the week, I added this as a one-off instead of the bird wizard friend of the same name. That's right, that's even Mind Sensor. A much better card for our synergistic game plan. How are you able to recover from that, uh, from that feeling? I have fucked up before, and I have recovered before. Like, you, you're just gonna have to get used to it. You, you play magic, you're gonna fuck up. That's how it is. Yeah, may, may, maybe even in this interview. The funny thing is, I went on to 4 1 this league. I beat both Prowess and Burn because this card ended up being obnoxious and really powerful in that matchup. One Wisp or Vesto or Charming Prince, and you gain six life from this guy. He also flies over the top, which means they can get over the creatures of both Prowess and Burn. He's like a pulse of Marassa that can also kick your teeth in and block an Ink Moth Nexus in a pinch. What a lad. This hand has a Wisp and a Ghost Quarter in it, both good at interrupting the explosive turns and board progression of the amulet deck, so I keep it. If I die to a tutor when this could have been a mind sensor, I'll be fucking livid. We both play tap shock lands and pass. They do so again, and we get to draw a four drop on turn one, and then another land on turn two, so we aren't doing much either. I don't play the Ghost Quarter here, which is probably a mistake, I feel, but I do have a path for the potential turn 3 Azusa into multiple land drops. Nothing from them. We play a Ghost Quarter, deploy a Wisp as a threat, and reset a White Source to keep up path. They play an Amulet, tap their lands a couple times, then do nothing, so there's something in the hand of the cast, perhaps a Once Upon a Time? We keep up two quarters and attack with a voided up wisp thanks to a noble that we freshly drawn. Our opponent uses Castle Garenbrake, a card that I claimed was bad in previous season. Whoops! To make a primeval titan. We look at our open three mana, we look at the Avon Rife Watcher in our hand, and boy oh boy do I feel fucking stupid. The moment an amulet opponent actually gets to resolve the ETB trigger of a primeval titan against us, our chance of winning become a lot slimmer. We probably lose like 20-30%. The second titan drops it even further by a similar amount. They get a Simic Grove Chamber and a Teleria West. We go Ghost Quarter the Chamber, and we Ghost Quarter the Teleria West before the balance triggers resolve. This means they can't Teleria West into Summoner's Pact into a second Titan. If they chain Titans, we probably aren't winning. We then path their prime time and realize something exciting. They didn't get a land of the second Ghost Quarter, nor the path. All our subsequent paths after this are now the best removal spells in the game, and Ghost Quarter is now strictly Strip Mine. <laughs> Yes! We attack them for four in the air. On their turn, they play a rock farm and get two triggers from the amulets. In response, we flash in Resto, flicker our wisp, return wisp to play, trigger, and target the rock farm. The rock farm leaves the battlefield and they have to then <laughs> bounce the land. They never get to six or eight mana this turn. Rock farm returns at the end of turn and they bounce a second land because of it. We crack in the air, gavelly pump our team, and take them to four. They once upon a time finding a gold turf and they concede. G G flickery. See, the MVP of that match was definitely Ghost Quarter. If they could chain a second prime time, they could have got some traction and perhaps got somewhere with it. The rest of Angel on the Flickers was also pretty good. I generally believe that between Ghost Quarters, Paths, uh, Tech Edge or Field of Ruin, depending on which we play, I think Field of Ruin is better as the fifth or sixth Ghost Quarters. Um, Arbiter to stop the, the Summoner's Pants, Flickers off Vials, uh, Restos and Charming Princes to reset the Flicker Wiz. Of, of all this stuff, we have really solid game against them. The other thing as well is that we have a good air presence, which means if they do get to go Field of Ruining and making shit tons of zombies, as long as you can survive a turn or two, hopefully you can kill them in the air, whether that be Flyers or Gavanid Flyers. So yeah, I think this deck is well positioned against Amulet if Amulet begins to be one of the best decks in the format, which it was already beginning to be when Oka was around. I've been Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comment section below what you thought of the deck. 
uh, the gameplay, the way it was edited. Let me know if you think Amulet is better. Oh, what's that stuff? Uh, Aether Vile was better. How did I forget what Aether Vile was? I'll be back in the next couple of days with some Theros Standard and Sealed. Slightly edited up and made fun stuff thanks to the preview event. So big shout out to Wizards for inviting me to that. That'll all be coming out on YouTube over the coming days. And I'll see you all very, very soon. Until next time, think of me when you kiss your lover goodnight. And I'll see you in the morrow. Tomorrow? Another time? I don't fucking know. Ta-ta for now. Thank <laughs> you.